Adams with Siemens. Hey everyone, um, my name is Chris Adams, I work for Siemens Energy. Uh, I'm in our R&D group, so what our group typically does is we design custom tooling that goes out to power plants and helps rip those things apart and put them back together. Um, the reason why we started looking at AMRs though is about a year ago, uh, we had a, a big facility over in New Kensington, um, and we took that facility and our facility near Boys Park and combined those and moved to one building over at RIDC Park in Mount Pleasant. Um, so the, what that facility did in New Kensington was held all the tools that our group kind of customized and, and designed. And so it's pretty much like a big, I mean, for lack of a better word, like an Amazon warehouse. So they have a really bad version of Amazon where you go on and order the tools and someone sits there and cranks those out the door and they come back, you have to inventory those, put anything that they might have used, like hard hats, safety glasses, um, drill bits, stuff like that, back in the box. So that's kind of what started to um, kick off this AMR journey, is to see are there ways that we can optimize the process flow. So instead of people walking around and getting things out of the tool crib and putting them over our kits, can we just automate that process back and forth? Or can we um, use robots to take tool kits off the shelves and move them over to shipping and receiving? So that's kind of how this started off. So um, we kind of got to talk about Siemens for two slides. I think everybody might know who they are, but they bought out most of Westinghouse a while ago. Talk about why we did this, I kind of just summarized. Um, our vendor selection process, um, the project goals and the challenges, um, and then our current status and what our future plans look like, and then wrap up if you have any questions. So, this is a bunch of marketing stuff I pulled from our internet, so I don't know what half of it means, but it's all right. Um, <laughs> but pretty much what we help to do is we can, we can make stuff um, all the way from helping out the oil, oil and gas companies to get um, natural gas into the power plant. Um, what we're uh, more responsible for is to actually go to the power plants and help them to get back online if they have a fall. If something went boom in the night, that's when they call us and say, hey, come in and help us, and that's typically what our group does. Um, we also help uh, in the wind business as well, and then we have an, also a, uh, a group that does most of the transmission from the power plants to residential or in, um, commercial, stuff like that. But I don't know what two thirds of those groups do. Uh, but this is what I know, because uh, this is where I work at. Um, so like I said, we're in RIDC Park in Westmoreland County. Um, we have 110 about uh, employees that come to our office every single day. Uh, we have over 260 that re you know, report elsewhere. They live in Montana and California and all the places that are, are cool in North Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh. Um, and we also have a really good partnership with the University of Pittsburgh. So at any given time, we have nine co-ops from Pitt. Um, that work in my group, they're computer engineers, they're industrial engineers, um, they work in the, the different product lines. Um, and like I said, what we do is we go to the power plants and help to rip them apart, put them back together. So, this is why we chose robotics. So we have about a 200,000 square foot facility that's this all warehouse. Um, and so how can we optimize that workflow? So all this blue right here are all racking. Um, that's about, I don't know, 18 feet high. Um, this area up here is our kit assessment, so all those guys really do is whenever a kit comes back from the field, they open it up, they see what's missing, and they replenish that kit, and that kit gets green tagged, goes back on the shelf, so it's ready to go um, for the next job. So um, we don't have a full-time material handler, which is one reason why we wanted to look at robotics. Um, no one's full-time job is to be on a fork truck, so if we can get that person off of a fork truck and doing value-added work, that's a huge plus for us. Um, so someone said, hey, can you go figure out a solution? I said, okay, cool, I'll do that. Um, so we went to Modex in 2018. Um, really, we were looking for more of like a, um, like a four truck kind of uh, solution, like secret. Um, and I came across all these mobile robots and thought, hey, those are cool, those are cheaper, they can get our hand tools around, um, they can't pick up the big stuff, um, but that's a smaller investment that would get in the door, our guys can get familiar with robotics, maybe we should start there. Um, so that's what we did. So I went to Modex and found all these companies listed, um, and then we started to evaluate each of them. So what we kind of came up with was the weight capacity. Um, we were targeting about 200 pounds, um, but that kind of seems to be like the sweet spot where no one was really at at that point. A lot of people did about 100, a lot of people did 500, but there was nothing really in between. Um, the investment cost, so how much was the robot, how much was the software, a lot of these have subscription fees. Um, every year, and then if there's a warranty as well, so how much is this going to cost? Also, if, if they offer a pilot, um, is there a sub fee for the pilot? How much is the pilot? Stuff like that. Customer support, um, you know, or if you pick up the phone or they used to talk to, um, you know, what's the response in this? Stuff like that. Uh, the vision system, are they using LiDAR? Are they using 3D cameras, 2D? Um, you can see 360 degrees around. 
can only see part of it, and they're trying to guess what's in that blank area. Um, then the software, is it cloud-based? Is it location-based? Um, Siemens IT sucks, so trying to put any software installed on a computer that wants to run is not always a fun journey to go down, so we were hoping for cloud-based. Um, what the safety features were, could you make it beep at certain times, could it stop at a, a pre-programmed intersection, that kind of stuff. Um, and was it open source? Could we get an API and, and then have a computer engineer kind of write a custom software and be able to have the robot do what we want it to do, not something that's out of the box in the company? Um, so that's kind of what we came up with. And we picked a company called Canvas Technology. Um, so this is their robot. Um, what's actually pretty cool is this is pretty much the robot down here. And then um, from the top up is just a bunch of 8020 aluminum, and we said, hey, we don't like what you gave us, and ripped it off and made our own thing. So that's what we kind of came up with, which looks similar, but there's buttons up here that help to pause the cart, and then we actually 3D printed these little brackets in there so we could put bins in there. Go ahead. And what's the capacity of that weight? It was a little over 100 pounds, like 120. Plus so you sacrificed your original goal. Yeah. I was about to say, that doesn't look like it can carry 200. No, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the first question was, well, what happens if we put more on it? They said, it just won't move. So, because I know our guys are going to try it out. <laughs> um, and what was nice, too, is they also had um, USB ports on the side of it. So we actually were able to mount an iPad right onto the cart. And then even if you didn't have an iPad close by or computer access, someone around the facility could just tell it where to go and it would just power itself and run off the cart and would drive itself to wherever you need to. So you never had to be like at a device, at your desk, or something like that. We just had it all programmed um, right from there. So um, this is its little charger. kind of used almost a QR code looking thing to try to dock itself. I'm not sure what other technologies used, but that's kind of how it figured out where its home base was and would try to line itself up to, to dock in there. Um, I think that's not right. But the, just like on a car, the red lights were, whenever it's backing up, you saw the red, the white lights were the front of the thing. Um, sometimes they actually can switch back and forth, so if it needs to go you know, a different direction, the back lights will turn white, um, the front lights will turn red. So we actually put a little steamer sticker on the front so we knew pretty much where the front was supposed to be. Um, Chris, what's up? Could you talk a little about the, a little more about the vendor selection process? Did you have some others that were like close second, or what was the um, the scope of what you looked at, were there others that you considered? For this initial application, there weren't, and mostly it was because Canvas was, I want to say, giving away the pilot, um, but it was only $6,000 for a three-month pilot. Um, and a lot of companies wanted to do like a $15,000 setup fee before you even talk about a pilot. Um, they were also, they didn't have too many solutions, they were very eager to work with us. Um, they had one product and that was really it. Um, but it was mostly the cost, um, and their subscription fees were pretty cheap as well. Um, so that was really what kind of drove it, because we didn't have to go looking for capital money, we could kind of just slide this under a different budget. <laughs> but it wasn't always fun and games with it, or uh, it wasn't always uh, you know, being serious at work, but you got to have some fun with it. Um, this was during a grand opening, it actually carried the uh, ribbon cutting scissors all the way through these tables, um, which was pretty cool. So. Uh, had some fun with that. Um, for Christmas, people decided to put garland on it, and put Christmas cookies on it, and it was playing Christmas music so around the facility. People were getting mad because they were like, I need to stop eating Christmas cookies, and I kept stopping at their location. Um, but it was fun, it was a good time. Uh, I didn't put them in here, even though their co ops didn't much matter, but we actually, one of our co ops was driving on the thing, mapping it around. Um, but she got in trouble for it, so I forgot she didn't picture. <laughs> How did it work in the crowded room in that uh, lunch area? Um, I was terrified because we had so many, I mean, that's my director, um, that's his boss's boss is right there, and I actually, I had the video, I'm sitting here with the Xbox controller, we're ready to, ready to remote into that robot in case we decide to go off on a tangent. The guy was actually there from Canvas and mapped that probably a hundred times the night before. But then everybody moved their chairs off, so it didn't really matter. <laughs> but it actually did a really good job. The only thing that actually got stuck at was it wouldn't go too close to the stage. And so when it was about that far out, I pressed the uh, button on the Xbox controller and drove it a little bit closer to the stage. But it actually got through there pretty quick. So. And this is a video of it just driving around. So we actually had a program where that green strip is on the right hand side is where people are supposed to walk at. And we actually got it down to it could drive itself right down that aisleway, pretty much um, in the center of it. 
and we didn't really veer off unless it thought that there was something in front of it. Um, if it had saw something on a previous drive where a pallet was in front of it, it would veer off, even though something wasn't there, we kind of call that ghosting. Um, but it actually did a pretty good job. You know, what was nice with it is that you just use an Xbox controller to map it, so as soon as you went into that controller, it was in map mode. Um, we actually found the very first day on the very first drive that whenever you were in map mode, all of its detection software is off. And so we drove it into an I-beam like, within like four hours of it being in a facility, which sucked. Um, but it was pretty nice, I mean, because you don't have to worry about like having an iPad with it. You just take that Xbox and sort of drive it around and, and it's trying to learn its map and everything. Um, one of the things that was cool with this is it actually has like almost a heat map. Um, so it shows you its confidence as it's driving around your facility. So if it was red, it said that that's not very confident. But if you saw it turning blue, that means it's pretty familiar with the area. And it's probably not going to make as uh, many mistakes in that location. So, um, so what we kind of did um, was this is the software that Canvas gave you out of the box. If you want a website, this is what you would see if you saw a map of your facility. So all of these little blue points are stop points that we put in. So um, B38 was actually a beam location where somebody was working. Same with A37. We made like a little parking spot in that area. I mean, you could orient the robot to be however you wanted to be in that spot. So if you wanted to get there and turn 90 degrees, it would do that. Um, one thing we noticed is that <laughs> it would start to get a little smart and, and cut corners. So from here to here, um, if you didn't tell it to drive all the way up and over, it would start to round off that corner. And four trucks are driving back and forth between this area all the time. And it would drive up there and this robot would start to swing in front of it. And it's quiet, you can't see it, it's really low to the ground. It's like a Tesla, it's not making any noise, it's electric motors. So what we started to do is have it come all the way out to this point and then cut down. And that's not something we really anticipated. Um, but just from spending some time with the robot, we were able to figure out and uh, go from there. So there's a lot more stuff this software could do, but I'll get to that later why I can't show you that. Um, but this is actually one of the iPad apps that we built. So a software engineer sits right next to me, um, and you, we, we had a bunch of stuff set in there. So we could tell it to go to the charger, go to certain waypoints. Um, we could go to the card status and see if it's lost. If it's lost, where is it? Um, we also made a queue system, so if a bunch of people wanted the robot at the same time, um, whoever came in first, you would see this connect, uh, request list, and it would go to A37, then B37, and then whatever, just going down for that list, and then go to the final location after that. If it's out of location, say it's at B38, and it needs to go back to the tool crib, we just hit release card, and it would just drive itself off as well. So. All right, so whenever we got the card in, we had a meeting with the guys that were gonna use this on a day-to-day -day basis. And these are kind of what we told them we were gonna expect out of it from day one, day 30, and kind of continuously going on from that. So um, we wanted to set the predetermined locations, like carve out a space in your workstation where this thing's gonna park itself, and please don't play anything in there. Um, we wanted to get the iPad mounted to the cart, and then have a reasonable amount of storage bent on it, because we figured out it's a pretty smooth surface on top of that grating, so we didn't want stuff to start sliding around. Um, we decided to, on day 30, um, would it be necessary to institute call buttons? So rather than having an iPad at every single work location, they just have like a little button on their desk and if they need the car, they just press the button and it just drives itself over. Um, and then improving the loading and unloading because people had to kind of bend down and grab a bench from underneath and we kind of made that process a little bit easier. So we were looking into stuff like that. Um, but what we wanted to do was reduce the manual delivery of items. So instead of them taking a cart and driving it back and forth from the tool crib, um, to we see that this is actually benefiting them and it is um, expediting that whole process. And then we wanted to work into their day seamlessly by the end of this, um, this pilot. So um, the way we were going to measure this stuff was number of trips per day versus the amount of replenishment orders that they got. So anytime that they had to go get something from the toll crib, the toll crib would get a list of, all right, I need seven pairs of safety glasses, I need four drill, uh, drill bits and stuff like that and we were gonna measure how many times that robot actually made a trip versus how many of those orders the tool crib actually got, and that's the way we were gonna kinda of compare it. Um, average route speed, was it faster to just walk rather than using this? Um, how much of it was on waiting time versus running time? And then how often it got lost versus being run? So that's kinda of what we were really looking at. Question? Yeah. Can you talk a little about the process because it's there's going to these different areas you had your call buttons where they could call for it. Is it always going back to the tool crib or do they then have to set it, oh, it's going to go to this location or that location? Yeah, so the, the tool, the precision tool area was kind of down here and these were the three areas that we figured we're going to use that spot the most. Um, so once they 
um, needed something to the car was here. They had to tell it to go to the back of the tool There's really no like smart way of it. No, I all right, now I need to go. Um, so you didn't need to kind of either manually go on the app and tell it to go, um, or go on the webinar face and kind of tell it to go. Um, that was the best way we could. Okay. Which you're probably really going between those three locations and the tool crib, so mm -hmm. it would always just be making those runs back and forth. Yeah. So if the tool crib, you know, delivered something and it was for both all three of these locations, um, you know, it would drive to that one and it would see okay, there's stuff that I don't need. What you know, it might say 837 on a piece of paper at the vent, then drive over to 837, you know, and then the person would be like, okay, it needs to go to B372, and then tell it to go there. Oops. Is that a limitation on the, their software, or just something you could get implemented in time to, to make that smarter? Um, I don't know, to be honest with you. I, I don't know how we could have figured out once you know X amount of weight was off of it, or that they were done using it, that it was ready to go to the next, next place. And, and you know, which place would that been? I mean, if all three of those locations had tooling on there, like which one would it have gone to first? Um, so. All right, some of the challenges, I kind of hit on this before. Um, the car tried to optimize the route, like going, you know, making a, a quick turn around a 90 degree, um, so making a 90 degree turn. Um, some of the four trucks um, come to a complete stop, and it was hard to make this thing actually take a pause if it, if it came up to an intersection. It would kind of just drive past it, but unless you like pre-program it to stop, it wouldn't actually stop. Um, and so we were actually working with Canvas to see if they could implement like a pause feature where it came up to a certain point and pause rather than just driving past that point. Um, it was quiet and hard to hear, so I joked that we should just put some tin cans in the back of it and make it like a car after somebody got married. Um, and then for whatever reason, every single day, um, I should do those three spots. We call it the Bermuda Triangle, and every day like four o'clock, it had no idea where it was in that area. Luckily, our, sip, our shift was pretty much done at four o'clock, but it was the weirdest thing, like it just freaked out and had no idea where it was. I had to re it into it, drive it back, and tell it's okay and caress it. So everything was great until this small company called Amazon actually bought Canvas out. Um, so they recalled the robots and said, hey, we have a technical glitch. And then two weeks later, I found out that they got bought out, which sucks. <laughs> um, so like, okay, cool. Well, I'll go back to one of these conventions again and do this whole vendor selection process over again. And we did, um, and we looked at it from a different way where um, all these robots now you know, can go up to 500 kilograms or 1,000 kilograms. So rather than just having um, canvas that could do the small stuff and then maybe getting secret to do that bigger stuff, can we maybe look at a solution that does all of it and we can umbrella that under one system? Um, so we looked at uh, Mir and we also were seriously looking at Fetch Robotics as well. Um, and we did a lot of back and forth and we decided to um, go with the Mir solution, which the RG Group is actually the local uh, vendor for. Um, so we're currently awaiting funding uh, to proceed with this one, but we're going to start small and work our way up. A bunch of our toolkits are about the size of a pallet, so they go really good um, on some of these larger robots and they fit in that weight capacity as well. Some of them just never will because they're just long boxes with weird stuff in it and you still need a four truck for it. Um, but what we're kind of looking to do is um, to increase the speed of using a four truck. Rather than a four truck going and grabbing one toolkit and driving it over to shipping receiving, go and grab another one, drive it over to shipping receiving. We have one of these sitting right next to it and it goes and grabs a box, pulls it off, puts it on one, tells it, all right, go to shipping receiving, grabs another one, drives that one over, and now you've essentially doubled your efficiency just by able to load something onto one of these things. So that's what we're looking at doing. Um, these are naturally a lot more expensive than the smaller robots. Um, so they need to go through a little bit more approval process, but that's kind of what we're hoping to do. Did you look at a company called Waypoint Robotics at all? Waypoint? Yeah. I've never heard of them. They're out of Boston. Uh, well, I would recommend them if you still have time to take a look. Uh, they're pretty uh, sophisticated and uh, open uh, platform. One that was cool about Fetch, which I actually really liked, um, was that they had a robot that had RFID sensors on it. And so if we put RFID tags on all of our um, containers, <coughs> and then wanted to see where stuff is all the time because we're really bad at putting stuff back to where it should actually go. Um, I, I mean, our R&D group of slugs that just borrow tools permanently and then never put them back. So this thing would actually drive itself around multiple times a day. And if you search for a certain toolkit or something like that, it would get, tell you pretty, um, with pretty good accuracy where that like, actual box was. So um, that was one thing we liked over Fetch. 
Um, but Near was local, um, they were cheaper, the software was cheaper, the warranty was better, so at the end of the day, um, that seems to be the best option. And we're so far away from actually implementing RFIDs that it wasn't really that much of a big deal. So There's one other you can consider too, which is Daifuku, Jervis Webb, okay. out of Detroit. All right. Talk to you later. Yeah, no, please. Um, so some of our future plans. Did you have a question? Yeah. Do okay. you ever see once you get to the second second iteration, do you ever see more than one installed for prototype? So what's actually cool with these, unlike um, Canvas, is that these robots go underneath and actually grab a cart. So you can have ten carts but one robot. So we would have had to have you know, we were talking about three or four of the canvas carts. I should have explained that, but these mirrors actually attach to like a rolling um, platform, and they can the robot goes, grabs it, moves it to wherever you want to. Then whenever you release it, you can just pull that cart off, have it work, and that robot can go off and do other work. And you can have, um, and you talked about putting conveyors on it. So one thing we're looking at is we have a lean lift, which is a vertical storage bin, and a lot of shelves with um, drill bits and whatever in it. So can we get a robotic arm to pull off a pair of safety glasses, put it on a roller, that robot takes it, drives it over to somebody, and no one has to even touch stuff. Like in the morning, you know, we have a bunch of replenishment orders come in, and all that stuff be at those workstations before somebody even walks to the door. So that's something that we're looking at. But yeah, that's what's cool about a lot of the companies now is that the robot is more just dragging a cart to a location. It eventually does the same thing. It just takes a cart to a location and drops it off there. So we're looking at how can we get carts to take a long, you know, something the size of this table, can we have it deliver that? Can we just put it up on its end and slot it into a, a rack and that thing takes it off? Um, instead of having to try to fit it onto like a tall robot or a long robot or something like that. So, um, so like I said, we're looking at possibly using um, a robotic arm to grab parts out of our vertical storage. Um, that's, we have one that we think we can optimize. We have actually have six of the vertical storage. Um, containers in our facility, um, so we want to optimize one and then go from one to two, maybe put that robot on a rail so it can go back and forth across them. Um, let's see, Raymond actually has a software called iWarehouse that they put onto four trucks, and um, it can tell you a whole bunch of information. It can tell you if the four truck ran into something, it can make you do checkouts before you turn the four truck on. Um, it can pretty much like pre-diagnose issues, so instead of having pro or um, maintenance, you know, something went boom and you need to fix it. You know, just like an oil change every 5,000 miles, hey, this truck's been driving a lot. Um, we think that you should do X, Y, and Z service on it. Um, hey, this four truck has never been driven to even actually need the thing at all. Um, that software can do all that. Um, Avid Boss is actually pretty cool. Um, they do industrial floor scrubbing. So, like, watch the big airports have robots like these on them that clean the floors. Um, so, at night, we just shut the lights off and have this thing go from uh, our, uh, our floors at facility. Um, MSC has these as well. Um, this isn't really robotics, but um, again, I said we were terrible at putting stuff back, so if we go gr uh, grab a drill um, that's tagged out to one of our guys, can we make it so that that person's not responsible for that drill and has to put it back in the locker or something like that? Um, same thing with vending machines. Um, you know, if we have training and need to get a bunch of safety glasses off the guys, rather than have it um, on a shelf, can we just put them on a vending machine like that? And actually have an idea of the inventory in our, in our facility. So, do your floor, floors need sweeping as well, or just scrubbing? No, just, in the warehouse it's just scrubbing. I just scrubbing. Yeah. I was just going to say there's a robotics company in our building here in Pittsburgh called Discovery Robotics. I mean, in our office it's, it's carpet, so maybe we should do that because this thing would not do well in there. It'd be a swampy mess in the morning. Yeah. So, luckily there's two doors that would have to go through before we got to that point. Or the or sorry, just go to the last. Uh, when you were evaluating me or with Canvas before, how did you go about looking at the, the return? Or was it something that you looked at to, to justify the, the cost? So that's something that we're, and what's hang, hanging up this right now, is really trying to nail that down. Um, because we have guys that will come on the weekends and, and pull in overtime. So how do we go and pull like, overtime numbers? Um, some guys just walk slower than other guys. Some guys have um, like electric scooters that take them back and forth to the building. So how do we calibrate like the time across all that? So that's what's really hanging us up right now. And we never really got to that with Canvas because the rug was pulled out from us before we even got the chance to get to that point. So we were closing in on it whenever that actually happened. So. I put a system like this in a couple, almost well, like 10 years ago for Alcoa. And it came down to the optimization of the path planning for us and 
um, to answer it, like, could we you know, justify the, the value of the system? So you might think about like trying to simulate some of that, even just like you know, uh, mathematically in like spreadsheet or something. And if you can get a system that all to like smarter planning, it uh, made a massive difference in their use case. It was a little different than your use case, but it, it changed the whole uh, kind of So we actually we had um, as a final project for I think the Pitt Industrial uh, Engineering Group, we had them look at this. Um, but they didn't take into account that, all right, that guy's going to walk back and forth from the tool crew, but he's also going to go grab a cup of coffee. And then talk about a football game over here, and then he's going to go do this over here, right? For so, like, how, we actually came up with a coefficient to try to take that kind of stuff into account. And it went from like a six year return to like a two year, maybe like a year and a half return. Um, but again, like, that's, we're still trying to iron that up. And, and, our, and our managers also want us to, like, all right, if you do this, that's cool, but what does after this look like? Like, what's the next thing you're going to implement? How can you build upon using someone like this? And that's what all that other stuff is that I showed you. Like, I know we're going to take that little robot, and then it's going to be able to use a roller system to get stuff from the lean lamp and to do that and get a robotic arm and everything like that. So he wants all that before he approves this one. <laughs> so. um, and as far as lessons learned, uh, this first one kicked us in the butt. Um, but go with an established vendor. I mean, Canvas, we sh if I wasn't so naive, I mean, they had one product. And that was all they had. Mirror has uh, six or seven, I'm not sure. So does Fetch. All of these guys are established and are probably not going to get bought out. They have a massive product line. Um, there's reasons why they're charging for you know that $15,000 to come on site and do a support. They want to see if they're serious. They've done this before. They've seen people duck out, stuff like that. Um, take the time to learn the software, um, understand the shortcomings and how to work around it. So like I said, that robot wanted to do like a, a, a cut, you know, cut a corner and not come up and then turn. So those are the kind of things that if you're just out there on the floor, you're going to learn not just back at your desk and like, oh, they'll go figure it out. Um, have multiple people trained. Um, I'm glad I have some co-ops with me because I would not want to be the only person that people call, hey, like if something went wrong and call Chris, like, I don't want that. Um, so it was nice to have other people in our office trying to figure out how to uh, troubleshoot the software if someone went wrong, what to do with it. Um, and then, not to make a plug for the RG group, but if, if it's possible, go with a vendor that's local. Um, Canvas was over in Boulder, Colorado. So if something didn't work at 8 o'clock in the morning, no one's going to be in the office there, right? So you kind of have to just wait. And at that point, then you start to get the grumblings of like, I could have just walked over and done it myself, like this robot's not really helping me out, blah, blah, blah. So having someone that's actually, at least in your time zone, if not local, um, goes a big way. Yeah, you actually need a software developer to be programming and scrap mechanical like the engineers and like do that. <laughs> um, we probably could have, but he's literally in the cube next to me and we're best okay. friends. Nice. So That's yeah. Awesome. <laughs> um, I I honestly I haven't coded for a while, but I bet our our um, co-ops could have probably figure something out. We actually have a computer engineering co-op too. Okay. So. It's work on the naval side. We just grab engineers and do it. Yeah. <laughs> we have a luxury and I exploit the heck out of it. Yeah. What sensors did you use? Well, I'm sorry? Did you use uh, LiDAR, um, cam 2D, 3D cameras? So um, Canvas had two uh, LiDAR cameras on the, on the front, one on the front, one on the back. And then on the four corners, they had three cameras. So you could see the whole way around 360 degrees uh, whenever it was traveling around. So you, you had, uh, in, in the image here, it had kind of like three spots where it was picking up stuff. Was that kind of the full scale implementation was to look like, or just with the, that prototype of you know the, uh, the important right here? Yeah, this was just for the pilot. Okay. Um, another big part of it, of the, I don't want to go too far into it, but whenever this was going on, we were in a massive transition on phase of our building. So precision tooling in our tool crib was down here, mm -hmm. and then they moved it up here, and it was going to come back down here. So trying to figure all that kind of stuff out with these drop points on top of having all these other areas here where the tools actually need to go, we decided let's hone it down for this initial pilot program. Let's just have stuff go from precision tooling to these three areas. Um, but I mean, I showed in, let's see. No, I just trying to get some here. So all of these little um, sections here mm -hmm. are all good assessment areas. And there's actually, this is a mezzanine right here, and there's four more underneath it as well. So I think we scoped out at least 10 drop points 
for an assessment um, for a new plan. And then we're going to have one for, for precision tooling, um, one for our tool crib, and then this is our R&D space over here. Um, and then we have a training area up there, so um, putting stuff in those areas as well to drop points. So we send you, I think, for this next pilot that you go on, you'll be trying to expand beyond those three. Right? Yeah. Yep. So we kind of like, whenever we were talking to these companies, they're kind of, there is a little bit of a learning curve as far as like, we actually know what we're doing, but we're not coming in brand, brand new. So, you know, they're encouraging us like, start small. Like, no, we, we kind of got that stuff out of the way. There's going to be some stuff that's going to take a little bit, um, but we understood how this worked and we're kind of ready to just jump full in the next version. Is it just your side that's working on this, or is other uh, parts of the team and health developers at the same time? Um, yes and no. Um, one thing that's nice was uh, whenever I showed that grand opening picture, we have another tool facility in Atlanta and one in Houston. And uh, it was pretty fun. The, the person who runs Atlanta saw this stuff and was like, man, that's sick. Like, she wanted this stuff down in her facility, like, ASU. Yeah. So, what we're trying to do is like be like the tech hub where we test it out, we figure out what it's doing, and then take our method and then copy and paste it to the other, uh, the other tool facilities in it, um, within Siemens. The one that's a little weird that's going to do their own thing uh, is a facility down outside of Orlando. Mm -hmm. It's called Fast Warehouse. Um, and they're shipping parts out like all day long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and so they're not doing kit assessment. Assessment is literally just like, taking boxes off the shelf and getting them out the door. Almost like what Amazon does. Yeah, it's literally like that, like just trying to just as fast as humanly possible. So they're not worried about you know looking at stuff and you know taking stuff back and forth. It's a one-stop operation for shelf, make sure it's right out the door kind of mm -hmm. thing. So um, I think they were looking at Mirror as well um, for their solution, um, but it's slightly different than ours as far as implementation goes. Any other questions for the first? Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for uh, putting that together, Chris, and sharing with the group. Well, I think now we'll just, uh, we're going to take